thank you everybody for attending. And, and as Carol mentioned, we want to thank the Washoe County Libraries for helping host our programming. And like she said, um, you know, we had to cancel a couple months of our programming, but now we've adapted to virtual. And so we really appreciate John and the library staff for helping us with this. And, and we were going to be working on programming for the fall and spring, but also we'll be looking at virtual options as well. In as, as time goes on, if things come up and we have to um, have both options, we'll be talking with our presenters um, in the fall first and spring for 2020, 2021 season. So um, I don't want to keep John Smith, our, our guest speaker, um, holding out too much longer here. Um, he was originally scheduled for our February first Sunday talk, but we had to reschedule him and he was so gracious enough to um, reschedule and he is our last speaker for the series. Uh, John wrote a wonderful book and when I saw it, I knew he was definitely um, a, a speaker I wanted to bring forward and definitely it was for Black History Month initially, but I think it's a, an important story that um, is for Nevada and um, a lot of people need to know about it. So uh, John wrote the book, uh, The West Side Slugger, John Neal's Lifetime Fight for Social Justice. And John um, Smith is a longtime journalist and author over a dozen books. And I just read an article in the Nevada Independent this past week um, that was written by John and um, just a, a wonderful writer and, and a, a great book. So I actually want to actually look at your other books, John. So without further ado, let me introduce John Smith, our speaker today. Hey, well, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be with you um, wherever you are, whoever you are. Uh, this is a great, interesting time. Uh, you know, I, I realize it's traumatic for folks, and I'm, and, and I'm, and I'm certainly sorry about that, but uh, it's also an opportunity to move forward in different ways, uh, communicate in different ways, and I just thank you guys for inviting me. I thank you so much. Uh, whoever's out there, I can't see uh, but uh, bless you all, and I hope you all have great health. And, uh, you know, the, for me, uh, as a, a writer and journalist uh, and a Nevada native, um, uh, my family uh, starts out, well, I'll start at the beginning. It, this could take hours, so get comfortable. Uh, no, I, I won't. I won't do that to you. <laughs> but my, my, family, uh, my family started off uh, in Nevada in the 1800s. Right, you know, you know, most of the people you meet, uh, they've been to in Nevada about eight weeks or ten weeks or something like that, and they're locals. Uh, but my family, actually, the first uh, Smiths from my branch of the Smith family, uh, in about 1880, uh, they were they were uh, born, uh, and there are uh, some years earlier, but the first Smiths born uh, in the state go back all the way to uh, when Aurora was uh, was. Uh, a place to be. Um, they, my a branch of the family was there. The Carson Valley, of course, very popular branch of the family was there. So I go back a long way in Nevada. Uh, and as you know, uh, those of you who've been here for a number of years, you know that Nevada has gone through many, many changes. Uh, tremendous change, tumultuous change, great growth. Uh, of course, the Great Recession, the latest pandemic, of course, is, is, is it's mind blowing, but uh, Nevada has also gone through this amazing social transition. And I want to talk about that tonight because this is really one of the things that I thought was important when I approached the Joe Neal project. Who, who is the soldier who uh, could provide a vehicle for me to talk about those issues? to bring out those issues. And it turned out, I mean, uh, I'll tell you how I met Joe Neal first, but uh, to take us through a certain tr very troubled era in Nevada, a an era where we went to a place where there was more lending, there was more integration, there was more celebration of in and inclusion than, uh, than separation of the races. <laughs> And so that's for me to, uh, you know, to talk about uh, or to write about Joe Neal's life, because uh, to a, in so many ways, it's representative of 
uh, you know, of, of ch the changes that took place in our country generally and those hard changes that took place in Nevada. Um, we live in a state, and I'm proud to say this, we live in a state that has a female majority legislature. Only one in the country. First time in the history of our, of our amazing country, first time in our history that that's occurred. Now, it occurred here, and the fact it occurred here, I would argue, is in part attributable to the dedication of a number of people who stood when others were willing to, were, were interested in sitting, who raised hard issues when others uh, feigned uh, away from them. And Joe Neal was one of those. He wasn't the only one. There were many soldiers in that fight and uh, many deserve great credit. Uh, um, however, uh, from my standpoint, Neil was representative. And so when people say, why a bi biography of Joe Neal? Why write about this issue? Uh, one of the things is, this is where, we're, where we are now, where uh, the assembly speaker, Jason Frierson, uh, is an African-American. Uh, Joe Neal in 1972 and 73 with the first session was the very first African-American elected to the state Senate. Nevada had uh, a very brief history prior to that of, of any kind of persons of color involved in the state legislature. A man named Woodrow Wilson uh, in, I believe it was 66, was elected on the strength uh, of his Republican Party status and his uh, relationship or alliance with Paul Laxall, who was, who was elected, of course, in 66 as governor. Uh, Wilson uh, lasted a term or so uh, and then moved, eventually went to the county commission and had other issues in his life that got pretty complicated. But uh, for, for me, Neil represented a kind of character. Um, a couple of first memories of Joe Neal. Uh, my folks, uh, my dad, Smitty, was, uh, a, he represented the Painters Union. He was a construction worker. Uh, he, uh, um, he, you know, he was a kind of a rough and tumble character. We'll say, we'll put it politely. My mother was in Democratic Party politics, who worked for, eventually worked for Governor Michael Callahan. Uh, and she, she had been part of the, uh, you know, uh, had been uh, um, uh, judge's secretary and clerk. She had done a number of different jobs, but she was very active in Democratic Party politics. So around 1973 or so, Neil is in Neil at this point, even though we went to the same church together, St. James Catholic Church. We're on the west side in Las Vegas, the predominantly black neighborhood there. Uh, we, we had met briefly but when I first learned who, about Joe Neal was, he was giving uh, the Democratic governor, the very popular Democratic governor, Michael Callahan, fits at the legislature because he refused to play on the team. He stood up and raised issues that were uncomfortable and that pushed social issues. And I'll go over a few of them as we go along, but pushed those issues into an uncomfortable area. Uh, of civil rights uh, and of, of, for instance, uh, returning the rights of felons, returning constitutional rights to people who committed crimes, gone to prison, paid their debt to society and gotten out again. Now today, uh, even the Koch brothers uh, would agree that people who have paid their debt to society should have an opportunity to get back their constitutional rights, their voting rights. But Joe Neal raised that issue in the early 70s, and he was absolutely a pariah. He was considered radical. And radical is, is an interesting definition. It's a changing definition in Nevada. Um, that, one, that was the first memory was around my dinner table as a boy, uh, my folks cussing, because my mother worked for O'Callaghan and was very loyal to him, cussing about this guy, Joe Neal, who won't go along with everyone. My next memory of Joe Neal was as a, a teenager. I was at Western High School, and uh, I have some of those terrible photos. If you grew up uh, or anywhere around the 1970s, you probably got this 
the bad hair photos from high school, and I certainly have those. Uh, and I was uh, part of a panel discussion about civil rights and how things have changed uh, for uh, people of different generations regarding civil rights. And of course, on that panel was the very outspoken Joe Neal. And so I got to know him a little bit as, as a high school teenager. Of course, as a journalist, I covered Neil quite often because he was often in the news. And um, what I want to do as we start this, I'd like to read a bit of my introduction um, about the Neil book. I won't quote from it too much later, but for now, I'd like to just read a bit of the introduction if that's okay. Um, and since no one's here to shout me down, I guess it's okay. So, but um, I hope I hope our sound is okay uh, too. Um, this is from the preface: an encouraging word from a dedicated teacher. The lessons of a careworn textbook deemed not good enough for white school children. A borrowed shirt fit for a bus ride beyond the, his insular existence. Of such moments was Joe Neal's young life made. Looking back across the decades, it's clear that his long journey from the sharecropped cotton fields of Louisiana to the halls of the Nevada State Senate turned on such barely recognizable kindnesses. With an uncommon tenacity, Neil knotted those humble lengths of rope and climbed from Madison Parish toward the light of opportunity. In a country that advertised equality, Neil appreciated at an early age what most African Americans of his generation eventually learned, that the fortunate and truly blessed might see a real chance for advancement come once in a lifetime. And when a chance came to move west to dusty, segregated Las Vegas in the mid-1950s, he grabbed it. He was quickly reminded that the racism he knew back home wasn't regional, but widespread, not isolated, but institutional. When it became clear that only an advanced education would make a real difference in his life. He joined the United States Air Force, served honorably, and earned the benefits of the GI Bill. He enrolled at Southern University and studied political science and the law at a time of great upheaval in the racial status quo in the country. He helped register the first black voters in the history of Madison Parish. Once he returned to Southern Nevada in the, in the summer of 1963, Neil worked for equal opportunity and became one of a small number of activists who pounded away at the door of politics and public accommodation until it opened a crack for African Americans and other minorities. Once in office as the first black state senator in Nevada history, Neil never forgot why he crashed the party. Fighting for an issue, getting knocked down, rising again, and never quitting. That was Joe Neal. He spent three decades forever calling on his colleagues to consider Nevada's poor, the mentally challenged, and working class to see the intrinsic fairness of the Equal Rights Amendment, to invest in job training so that the least skilled might find their own footing, to expand the state's decrepit library system, to seek more funding for public schools. He seldom missed an opportunity to hold up a mirror to the state's powerful interests, knowing it would brand him not only a rabble rouser, but also the lowliest orphan in Nevada politics the elected official who is, quote, not a team player. Joe Neal's life when from Louisiana to Las Vegas is emblematic of a greater struggle of so many African Americans to rise from meager means, persevere through racism-driven adversity, 
and Jim Crow venality and stand up for social justice despite daunting odds. And it all began in Madison Parish. And so for Neil to be born in 1935 in what was called the blackest parish, the blackest county essentially in America, almost all African American, more than 90 of the population of that area was black. Nobody voted. There were no registered voters of color in that parish. The small number of whites voted, controlled everything from the water company to the bank, uh, to the local infirmary where blacks could not go. Uh, and that's the, that's the world Joe Neal grew up in. He comes from a, a home of transition. His mother went to work outside of the, of the house. His father. And folks who may have. Uh, poor, to be oh. sure. Uh, which is, pardon? Are we okay? We are, John. There was a little hitch. I'm not sure if, uh, if it was on my end or otherwise, but I think we're good. So please go ahead and I apologize for the interruption. No, no sweat. Uh, you know, he grew up at a time in a place where with, our, with all the help you get to register to vote. You can drive through, you can register your car and register to vote. You can, you can do almost anything and register to vote. But then, back then, uh, the, that parish was notorious for uh, when, when a person of color had the temerity to even ask about registering to vote. They had to interpret the constitution and to be able to quote from it in order to qualify as a registered voter. And in addition, you had to have one person who is a registered voter vouch for you. Of course, the only people who are registered to vote were the white people in the parish. And so for years, that did not occur. Now, back in Joe, as a young person, uh, Joe took it as uh, a blessing that he was able to go to a school called Thomastown School. It was part of a, essentially a pilot program during FDR's administration, uh, where uh, the fortunate were able to attend a school that, although it didn't have new textbooks, it had a floor and it had classrooms and young black students were able to attend it. And so he managed to go to school at a time when not everyone was doing that in his community. Uh, he worked uh, in the fields uh, as well uh, at that time in his life. And one of the transition times, if you know your Nevada history, you know that after World War II, uh, there was a, a kind of diaspora uh, of, of African-Americans from that Tallulah and Fordyce area of <coughs> Arkansas and Louisiana. And uh, there was a, 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 tra a um, migration of people to Southern Nevada, initially to work uh, in the uh, war plants of Henderson and elsewhere, uh, and then later, uh, during the expansion of Las Vegas, uh, there was another migration. And uh, Joe's mother, Josephine, was part of that migration. So when, while Joe finished high school, after high school, he wound up going to Las Vegas. And he experienced something in his, you know, in his naivete. Uh, he, he went west thinking west would be very different thinking it wouldn't be that place where your voice didn't count, where you essentially were a second-class citizen. What he experienced when he got out to Las Vegas was what's been called, you know, the Mississippi of the West, a place that was not only, not only conservative, but very much backward to a great degree. Not unique in America in the mid-1950s, but certainly nothing that uh, we would look back with pride on. And so uh, Joe experienced that. He got to the point where he understood after some menial with jobs that he wanted more from his life. 
And so from there, he uh, uh, went to apply uh, to become a part of the police department. And he was, he was turned down. Uh, he didn't have the qualifications. And so he decided to join the Air Force. And what he experienced in the Air Force is interesting. Uh, you know, in that, in that mid to late 50s time, uh, a time of, of transition and actually a time in the military of blending of the races really for the first time uh, after World War II. Uh, and so he would, became a military policeman. He served at a number of different Air Force bases uh, in New Mexico, in Texas, uh, eventually at Indian Springs. Uh, and when he got out, he used that time uh, he benefited from the training that he received. First time he went to a dentist was in, was in the Air Force uh, he, because no dentists were available uh, when he was a young person. And so uh, back in, in Nevada, he now had his experience as a military policeman in the Air Force. And when he uh, pushed to see if he could become a police officer, he found that despite that experience, he still didn't qualify and was actually instructed to maybe try Los Angeles and leave town because there might be hiring there because they weren't hiring uh, the Joe Neals of the world in Las Vegas in that era. And so he decided that he would take his GI Bill benefits and go to Southern University where he studied politics, he had political science, he studied the law, uh, but he also became politically active. And this is where the story starts to change. Uh, Neal became part of uh, essentially part of the greater Freedom Summer era, where uh, people with Justice Department instruction were led to go back to their communities and try to register to vote and to build the case uh, to have voter registration uh, to, in order to uh, take advantage of the earliest uh, of what became the Civil Rights Act. Uh, uh, and so Joe went back there and, of course, found uh, a few people who were brave enough to join him. Uh, they tried to register. They went through the process. They were, of course, denied. Uh, a was allowed to come back to Madison Parish, where Joe Neal became the very first person of color to register to vote in the history of that area. And uh, it was with that, that he did not stay in Louisiana. Yeah. Although he was registered to vote there, he left immediately because of the potential to, for it not to be safe, because of course it was not safe for a lot of people. He went back to Las Vegas with that confidence, uh, finished up his college at Southern, uh, became uh, active in Democratic Party politics in the early 1960s. Now, this is at a time when, you know, the Baker versus Carr uh, case was tried or was, a, was before the Supreme Court, uh, became the one man, one vote issue in our country. Uh, the public accommodation bills were, were finally being resolved by the Warren Court, uh, that there was great progress uh, in, 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 in the legal field, but those those court decisions were often only part of the story, right? I mean, you can, you can win in the court of law, but it's really the court of public opinion uh, and public participation that you need to win in. And so uh, that transition in Nevada is very difficult. You know, there was foot dragging in Nevada when it came to the one person, one vote uh, uh, rule. Um, there was foot dragging for a decade after, after Baker versus Carr. And so, you know, and it was that way with a lot of things. Hawthorne, very slow to transition. Other places were real showdowns for, uh, and, and the downtown Las Vegas area, there were real showdowns for whether segregation would win the day or not. Um, and so Neil was part of that. He participated in it at a time he was doing that. He also worked at time at the uh, titanium metals company. Uh, he raised his family, uh, uh, several children, uh, successful marriage, uh, ran for office in the late 60s a couple of times and did not win. 
But after reapportionment, after all that foot dragging to change the, the rules and uh, Southern Nevada with its increased population wound up with more assembly seats, wound up with more Senate seats. And so Joe Neal ran and, and won in 72 and started serving in 1973 in the Nevada legislature. Now, to just what I've just described is a guy who's gone through already in his life. Uh, in the Air Force, he experienced a number of times where that those stories that have almost become boilerplate uh, in movies about the era, where you know the servicemen get off the bus and go to the cafe in Texas or New Mexico, uh, and you know the black service members who are serving their country can't get a sandwich. Uh, those kinds of indignities uh, stuck with Joe. And they really stuck in his craw. And so by the time he got to the state legislature, as the, o the, only, uh, the only black in state Senate, uh, you know, he made his voice known. Uh, he made it clear. He, I've, I interviewed a number of people who served with him in those years. They said he was, uh, could be very difficult <laughs> to deal with. He didn't play well in the sandbox of politics in Nevada. No big surprise. A, a person who thinks differently, who sees the world with different experiences, brought something different to the legislature. Um, he immediately started on a, what became really a tradition. And looking back at it, uh, after doing the, the research on it, it's really kind of funny uh, to me because in the early 70s, Joe Neal is raising the issue on the floor of the Senate. He's bringing up things like, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King had been assassinated, of course, a number of years earlier. Uh, that was a, still a very big issue in, in most communities, I think, but it was certainly in the black community. And so, uh, you know, Joe, Joe spoke to that every chance, every session of the legislature, he raised the issue of fairness. He raised Dr. King's uh, image and goals. Uh, and Joe was, Joe was, uh, was uh, more assertive uh, than, uh, you know, in many ways than the followers of, of the nonviolent movement of, of Dr. King. Uh, he was far more outspoken and uh, not, as, not uh, as pious, certainly. Uh, and Joe talked about African-American history. And another thing that he did uh, in his floor speeches, he also talked about, after get, doing the research, he also talked about uh, the role that African Americans had played in Nevada history, whether it's Ben Palmer, those of you who live up north, you, you may know Ben Palmer's name, uh, the first, uh, first African American to own land and to be a rancher up in, in northern Nevada, uh, and any number of others that Joe would talk about. Now, uh, I'm making him sound like a one-dimensional player. He was anything but that. Uh, he was a very reliable supporter for the decade that basically Nevada struggled with the issue of the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, Nevada came close uh, to passing the ERA a couple of times, fairly close anyway. Uh, and uh, at least in my opinion, my, much to our detriment, we did not embrace that change then. Uh, we later embraced it, of course, uh, much more recently. Um, and Joe was, was a reliable uh, soldier in that fight for equality because he understood not only was it the right thing to do uh, to have equality for the sexes, but it was also important that as a person of color, he understood what it's like to be treated like a second class citizen, like a person who's whose work is good enough to hire, but you're not good enough to earn the same amount of money that someone else earns, that sort of thing. So Joe, Joe had a certain, um, what, what I consider real hot button issues in Nevada politics in those days. He also was a guy who was able to work on a variety of other issues. Uh, one of the issues that, that I think people are surprised by and hopefully will be interested in, in the book uh, is his focus on improving the water quality, protecting the water of Lake Tahoe. 
Now we think of that as, as the environmentalists think of it now. Uh, and we all kind of accept Lake Tahoe that no one wants to harm or, or pollute. But there was a time in the 70s when the casino guys, they, they loved their location, but they weren't always interested in spending money to protect it, uh, to protect the, the uh, effluent uh, from polluting the lake, from, from changing the, the clarity of the water, uh, from building modern uh, sewage and drainage systems that would the water from not over over cutting uh, the wood and changing the 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 uh, filtering system uh, that the lake has that helps make it so pristine uh, and Joe Joe did a lot of research on that and you know what happened and this is classic Neil you know Joe didn't have friends in the Nevada legislature on this topic there were a few, but, but the, there weren't a majority. Most of them were tied, tied in to the power brokers. And so Joe basically aligned himself with the California contingent, because of course this is regional, this was a regional area, uh, and a man named John Garamendi, who is now still serving in Congress. I interviewed Garamendi for the book, and he recalled Neil very clearly as saying, you know, he was very outspoken about the importance of the issue uh, and not, um, you know, not necessarily warmed by the casino guys. Uh, I mentioned that because in a few years later, there was a, in 1980, there was a terrible fire at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. It killed more than 80 people. Um, a few days later, fire at the Hilton in Las Vegas. Uh, one was, uh, the latter was an arson. The, 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 uh, the first was a, apparently a wiring issue. Uh, and Neil was a very active part of driving through the changes that helped create Nevada's uh, hotel fire safety law, which became, um, you know, at, at the national level became the leading legislation. It was a real game changer, not just for Las Vegas, but the retrofitting issue was a big deal nationally. And Nevada had a very proud, a very sad, tragic place in starting in, in, in part of the story, but a very proud place at the end in no small part because of the activism and the fire of Joe Neal. And so you've got this guy who, you know, doesn't play well with others, but he understood the bully pulpit and he understood the rules of order. Now, some of you folks who, who go, back all, uh, go back a few years in Nevada, especially around the legislature, uh, will remember Leona Armstrong. Leona, Leona Armstrong was, uh, you know, one of the great uh, forces of nature at the legislature for 25 or 30 years. Um, it was from Leona Armstrong that Joe Neal learned the importance of mastering this very thick manual called Mason's Manual. Uh, if you dropped it on your foot, your toes would be crushed. It's a seven or 800 page manual. Uh, but, it, but it is essentially uh, the rules of order of the legislative process for the state. Uh, it's used in other places, uh, but knowing it, uh, most, most legislators, I tend to think, read a few pages of it, perhaps some read more. Joe Neal essentially memorized it. And so he understood uh, what could happen in the minority. Uh, when, if, when you're in the majority, certain, certain uh, rules are beneficial. When you're in the minority, you can still uh, fight your good fight. And Joe understood that. Um, but along the way, of course, you know, he, he, made, uh, he made some enemies. And um, talk about them in just a sec. Um, uh, I, wanted, I, I, wanted, I do want to, to defer to a piece of the book just to give you an idea of how upsetting he could be to people. He, uh, he you know, when Michael Callahan was governor, he was, Mike was a very popular governor, good guy, uh, firebrand. Democrat, uh, you know, had been a war hero, was a very, very popular cat. And uh, during one of his State of the States, 
he raised the issue uh, because a, an officer, a police officer had been shot and he raised the issue of, you know, we must protect our police officers. We're going to increase the penalty for someone who shoots a police officer. Now that's a very common tough on crime issue. And I'm not really criticizing that the issue itself. I understand why someone would stand up and want to do that. But Joe Neal came from a community where unarmed citizens were shot on a fairly regular basis, that they, their civil rights were violated more regularly than not. And so he raised an issue and he did it not to, not to criticize the police, he did it to remind people that there's a lot of injustice out there. This is how he went about it. Just one sec. This is during the State of the State, and I'll start with O'Callaghan. Uh, O'Callaghan tossed a bouquet to the tough on crime contingent by calling for the death penalty for the killers of cops and prison guards. Although the governor had been a dedicated advocate for the state's penitentiary officers, to Neil it smacked of a cop out. At a time, the headlines were full of frightening tales of violence perpetrated by groups such as the Weather Underground, and the Black Panther Party. Neil knew that Las Vegas Blacks had far more to fear from Sheriff Lamb's deputies than the other way around. Quote, I'm sitting here as he gave his state of the state address, knowing of course that someone from the press will ask me about this particular statement, Neil recalled in an interview. So when they asked me about that, I said, why give the death penalty to one who kills a policeman? Why not give the death penalty for killing a janitor? Life is life. It's important to a janitor as it would be to a policeman. The press took it and ate it up, he said. And Las Vegas, uh, Las Vegas Sun columnist Paul Price, a friend of the sheriff and a fierce bulldog in the employ of Hank Greenspun, immediately placed Neil on the editorial radar. It was the start of an ugly relationship. O'Callaghan was angry over the fact that I had upped him on our issue, Neil remembered. So our road would become a little rocky from that going on during that particular session. And so Neil spoke up and raised prickly issues at a time when essentially no one in Nevada politics was doing that. Uh, at least at least in that area. Uh, others were raising issues of welfare rights and fairness and things like that, but very few people would approach the tenor uh, of Joe Neal. And so uh, later in his career, um, Neal becomes that lightning rod. Uh, he more or less remains that. I did mention earlier briefly the issue of returning felons their constitutional rights after they've paid their debt to society. It took years in order for that to be pushed through. It took uh, help from people like Chris June Kiliani and a real, a really a new generation uh, of folks uh, and, uh, and Dina Titus and, and many others whose names will, will be memorable uh, to people who study Nevada politics. Uh, and uh, that became one of those victories that, uh, that only took 25 years to make. Um, Neil fought for public education improvement. Uh, he was a, a really tireless advocate for equal treatment. Um, he also did something that <laughs> made him an enemy of the gaming industry. Um, he fought to increase the gaming tax. And he reminded people at a time when very few in the media uh, were willing to do it. Uh, Joe Neal spoke up and said, remember, uh, you know, we paid 6.25% the gaming tax. New Jersey, it's almost 10%. And as the time went on and more jurisdictions uh, became, um, joined the legalized gaming phenomenon, he would remind people that it's 11% in this state and it's 13% over there. And if you're in England, it's 20 something percent. And 
uh, he would remind people much to uh, the dismay of the very clout heavy gaming representatives at the legislature, both in the legislature sitting and voting and the lobbyists who influence them. And uh, Neil was, you know, was considered a, a heretic in that regard. Uh, he also pushed to hold uh, gaming mogul Steve Wynn's feet to the fire when it came to a, an art tax. Uh, there was a time when the, the casino mogul focused on collecting art, displaying art, uh, having his casinos identified with art and with, with high fine uh, taste. And uh, Neil reminded him that when you, when you purchase art and you bring it into the state, if you're going to display it, you know, first of all, there's a transfer tax to deal with. Secondly, uh, if you're, you, that, that there are taxes that need to be paid. And that set off an absolute fire alarm in gaming. Uh, Neil challenging Steve Wynn, uh, you know, first of all, people la in the, the press essentially downplayed it, laughed it off. But after a fashion, they realized that working people, that a lot of people wondered, well, who gets special treatment in Nevada? And I think they found out more and more as time went on that Joe Neal was one to stand up and point fingers. Now, that didn't win you a lot of friends in, in the, you know, the penthouse, but I think Joe got a lot of respect from working people. Uh, he ran for governor a couple of times. Uh, on a kind of uh, underdog's underdog ticket. And he mainly ran to raise the issue of the need to raise the gaming tax in the state. Kenny Gwynn, uh, the very popular governor, <clears throat> you know, won a couple of terms almost by acclamation. Uh, he was so popular. Uh, Neil ran against Gwynn largely to raise that issue. And I think, if truth be known, he provided cover for gaming tax because that's what happened. And so um, in the end, Joe Neal spent more than three decades uh, in the state. He raised a lot, a lot of issues. Uh, the title of the book comes from a statement by Cliff Young. Cliff Young, uh, you may remember, of course, as the Supreme Court Justice, but prior to that, uh, he was, I believe, Harvard-trained attorney who served and it was Cliff Young who said, you know, Joe, you're the West Side slugger. You get knocked down. Thank you for your patience, folks. I, I'm hoping it'll come back in. There we go. Are we there? We are. Please go ahead. Anyway, I'm a, I'm a, no, I was about wrapping it up, but that's uh, hopefully you heard some of it. Uh, and um, but that's really Joe's legacy. Uh, I, I didn't discuss, uh, the, he was one of the ramrods uh, to push through legislation that helped uh, expand the public library system in the state. Uh, he was a key player there. He was a key player in a number of areas where Nevada's uh, uh, ability uh, to grow uh, in different ways, not just in economic ways, but in in ways of in, in trying to improve public schools, trying to improve schools, especially in poor neighborhoods, uh, and uh, and expanding the library system, I think Neil deserves great credit for that. Uh, you know, so there are wins and there are losses, uh, but he was certainly a man in the arena, and um, he celebrates his 85th birthday in July, and I can't wait to go to the party. I'm really looking forward to it. His family is a lovely, lovely family. And of course, Dean and Neil is a member of the State Assembly. That's Joe Neal's daughter. Uh, he has a number of wonderful kids who are all grown up with their own families. And so uh, uh, he's a success story, a great, interesting Nevada success story from that standpoint as well. Uh, and I do have a bit of news, if I can add at the end here. Uh, my new book is called Saints, Sinners, and Sovereign Citizens. Uh, it's out with the University of Nevada Press in September. Uh, it is about the phenomenon of the Bundy family's showdown with the government in its historical place uh, in the public lands uh, fight in uh, Nevada. Uh, Nevada, of course, is a majority uh, uh, federal public land. 
state, uh, more than 85% uh, controlled in one way or another. And so uh, that's been a contentious issue, will continue to be contentious in our state. And I, I, took, a, I took a whack at that uh, and they were kind enough to, to publish it. It'll be out in September. I have a few other things going on too, but we'll wait, we'll wait till next time. And now we can open it up to uh, questions, but John, could you tell us where we can uh, get the West Side, a copy of the West Side Slugger? Uh, absolutely, thank you for reminding me. You know, probably nowadays the easiest way to go is Sundance Books uh, in Reno. Very nice folks there, love, that, love the place. Uh, they usually carry a copy or two, uh, and hopefully they'll, they'll have it there. I know the university has, has carried it, um, I, and also, of course, University of Nevada Press has its website. Um, uh, Amazon is where I direct most people nowadays, because that's kind of the game. Uh, so Amazon's got it, and um, I'm happy to, uh, uh, happy to direct you there. Um, so... Um, but anyway, I, I, I hope you'll give it a try. It's, uh, um, it's in paperback as well as hardback. So there's a couple of price points. And, um, you know, it was, a, it was a, a labor of love for me to write it and to research it. I learned a lot. And um, uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, John. And do we have any questions? And uh, you can use the raise your hand feature. Uh, you can wave at me uh, or otherwise indicate if you have a question. Uh, Lorraine has a question. Please go ahead, Lorraine. Always. Um, did Joe Neal do a forward for the book? I totally endorse your book. Uh, you know, uh, he, he did not control the book. Um, he sat for many interviews with me. Uh, we, we sat, I probably gained 20 pounds at the Krispy Kreme uh, that we sat at and drank coffee and ate donuts and talked uh, for I don't know how many hours. Had a wonderful experience from that, uh, in that. Um, uh, he did not write a forward to it. However, uh, Clady White of the Nevada Oral History Project at, Univ at UNLV, she was kind enough to do an, inter an introduction uh, and Joe, of course, uh, was with it every step of the way. And uh, I compared um, a, a lot of the oral histories that had been done. He'd done a couple of them. Uh, and uh, I, I used that material. I used uh, material drawn from his uh, floor speeches, uh, which were pretty voluminous. Uh, and then a number of, of personal interviews with a number of different people from, you know, Dina Titus to a number of his colleagues and uh, his family members as well. So I tried to be as encompassing as I could with the, given the scope of the project. What, how do you think your mother would react to you being um, highlighting Joe Neal's life? My mother? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she would, I, she would love it. She would, uh, you know, she, she really liked Joe uh, on, in many areas, uh, including at St. James Church. Uh, they were very good friends. They argued all the time. Uh, they, but they argued over the right things. You know, my mother was a member of the NAACP uh, in the 60s. Uh, she helped plan the memorial uh, and the, the, the parade, which became the Martin Luther King Day Parade. Uh, those early memorials to, to Dr. King, uh, she was on the board that did that. Uh, and, uh, but she also was very loyal to Michael Callahan and uh, she would cuss a blue streak if she thought Joe needed it. So, so there's, you know, it's like real love, right? You know, it's like you can't argue with your family, hey, why show up? Okay, one last question for me. Do you live in Las Vegas area? Or are you a Reno person? Well, you know, that's a great question. We have tried we for off and on for a year to move up to Reno and Carson. My wife, Sally Denton, who's a writer, a much more known writer than I am, uh, Sally Denton uh, is in the Hall of Fame in Nevada. Uh, she and I have looked, 
We almost bought a house a few months ago. Um, Sally's mom, Sarah, uh, is of an age where we're trying to be helpful there when we can. Uh, so we split our time now. Uh, we have a house in Boulder City where her mom lives. And so we're there a lot. Right now, I'm calling you from New Mexico where Sally has a house outside of Santa Fe. And so that's probably why the signal might not be, might not be great. But uh, uh, that's where we are now. I go back to Las Vegas in just a couple of days, uh, and I'll be back there doing some work and, and uh, you know, doing what we do, which is journalism and writing books and magazine articles, things like that. All right, thank you, Lorraine. Do we have any other questions? And I do not, uh, oh, uh, Linz, please go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to thank you for a really informational talk. I'm not, not from the area, so I was uh, politically interested that you were naming a variety of government governors and things, and I'm sure most of the people at tonight's presentation know who they were, but I didn't. I really loved how you wove it all together, so thank you. You know, I, I apologize. I really had a hard time understanding you. I, I, my, my reception is not great. And so I had a really hard time understanding your question. And Linz, yes, it did break up a little bit. So uh, p please feel free to, to try again. But I, I think she was uh, uh, just appreciating uh, you doing the book and providing uh, this program. Uh, oh, Linz. thanks. Well, heck, that, that was an easy one. Thank you very much for saying so. I really appreciate it. And, you know, I, I don't say it enough. Uh, I really am heartened by um, the tenacity of these groups that stay together, the library groups, the historical societies in our state, Southern Nevada, Northern Nevada. There is this great network of very dedicated people. And I know you're, you're all getting rich from your dedication. You're not. Uh, the, uh, but, you know, that's, I really appreciate it. And it's nice to be included in your program. Thank you. Thanks for the kind words. And we have a, another question from Rosie. Please, uh, please go ahead. Well, hello, John. Um, I have to just tell you that I was looking forward to this because I really didn't know very much about um, Joe Neal. I was aware, of course, when he was in the legislature, but this was really fascinating. And also, I guess I don't really have a question. I'm just here to praise you. <laughs> And your wife. I have three of Sally Denton's book on my bookshelves, and I just purchased yours. So thank you very much. <laughs> Awfully nice of you. Thank you for saying so. All right. Do we have any other questions before we wrap up here? And Carol, would you like to say anything else? Well, this is usually when I come in and say, let's, let's everybody give him a hand. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thank you very much, John. And thank you everyone for being here. And uh, again, for more virtual programs this summer, including Nevada Historical Society, please visit washoecountylibrary.us and sign up for our newsletter and join us on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, June 3rd for Mysterious Bats of the Lake Tahoe Basin. Cool. Yay. Have a great night, everyone. And thank you again, John. <laughs>